The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. This podcast is proudly brought to you by Franklin Templeton. Shifting financial markets are providing new opportunities for fixed income investing. At Franklin Templeton, we have a 50-year history as a global leader investing in fixed income markets and a strong track record of navigating market cycles. We offer investors a comprehensive range of active fixed income solutions managed by our seasoned specialist investment teams to help find opportunities in global and local markets. For yield, diversification and performance, Partner with Franklin Templeton to help elevate your approach to fixed income. Connect with us today at franklintempleton.com.au. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I'm incredibly excited for today's one. Jackson Milan, uh, Aureus Financial, thank you for joining me. I see your stuff all over the internet. You probably see my stuff all over the internet. So I'm, I'm excited to kind of get a peek behind the curtain as to uh, what your business is and how you operate. So thank you for joining me today. Looking forward to it, mate. Thanks for the invite. Maybe let's start with with a bit of your background. I'm sure like a, a lot of people, part of the Ensemble community, if they're on Instagram, if they're on TikTok or any of these types of places, they may very well have come across you in the beard and you're out out uh, collecting snakes and stuff like you were talking about before we pressed, uh, before we pressed record. But can you tell us a little bit about your journey in financial advice before we actually get to what are you doing today? Love to, mate. So let's go back to the very beginning. Uh, so my parents were business owners. Uh, dad was a tradie. Mum was a hairdresser. And they worked incredibly hard for as long as I could remember, uh, 16 hour days, day, seven days a week. And as a kid, they always said to me, Jackson, if you want to be successful in this world, you need to work hard for it. And that's a pretty curious kid. So it didn't stack up for me because we always had a roof over our head and we always had food on the table. But I didn't have the same opportunities that uh, my friends at school had. And I always knew that we weren't well off. We were poor. And um, we were always part of that kind of group of families that if there was a school excursion or a camp, that we would be taken aside and put onto a payment plan. And, and it was kind of awkward. And look, I, although I never saw myself as poor and I, I didn't have any stigma associated with that, it was definitely present throughout my childhood. And I put two and two together and I realized that my parents were working for money as opposed to money working for them. Now, originally, I actually wanted to be a vet, and that's an important part of the story because I kind of come full circle, but I realized that I needed to be a catalyst for change in our kind of complete history of working class and people who worked to make ends meet, never had any surplus, never built any wealth. Like the highest level of attainment of anybody in my family is owning their home uh, and in many cases, uh, dying with a significant mortgage. So I decided that I was going to uh, become a, a financial advisor. And back then in the early days, uh, I landed an opportunity with a place called the Financial Advice Center, which is basically an advice traineeship. As you know, the original DFP was relatively straightforward. A lot of it was learnt on the job. And in that particular environment, we were doing uh, basically commission-based insurance sales for the big banks. Yep. And I absolutely hated it, James. And <laughs> my idea of wealth was helping people like my parents. And what I observed was either in the environment that I was in, selling commission-based products to, quite frankly, people like my parents who didn't need it, mm. or to people who were really wealthy and getting could afford holistic advice and was helping them build even more wealth. So I was pretty disheartened and I almost quit. And yes. kind of as a fleeting thought, I said to myself, well, Jackson, if you're not going to try and create what you thought this industry was going to be, then who is? And I, I went down a different pathway. I started calling myself a wealth coach. And through some great mentors in, earlier on in my career who were holistic advisors, I basically built my own educational-based philosophy for business owners to help them maximize their profit and improve their cash flow and take that business profit and build their first wealth. Yep. And, and basically, I've been doing this for over 16 years now. Uh, we've built a, a multi-seven-figure business. Uh, we've got a team of 35 now, and uh, I've, uh, I've, I've enjoyed every bit of it. So it's been an awesome journey. That's incredible. 35 people you're up to now. That's amazing. Well done. And in in the midst of all of that, following along uh, as I have for a, for a while on your on your social media, you've you've moved to uh, the 
what, what, what do you call it? What do you call it where you've moved to? Well, uh, we call our place Aureus Acres, and uh, yeah. we're kind of come full circle because I realized being a vet was never really for me. And um, having an animal sanctuary was what really uh, fed my soul. And we brought our, our dream to life. We spent a year traveling around Australia we having a four wheel drive. Once again, trying to show our clients how to create a lifestyle business. And I wrote a book around it. And then we found our dream home up in far north Queensland. And we've, uh, we've bought this beautiful 70 acre property. We've rescued over 100 animals. And uh, basically, we've been able to create financial freedom for ourselves in our early 30s. So I'm very fortunate for that. But a lot of it is about showing people alternative pathways to freedom. I think there's a lot of, I guess, the societal pressure and uh, bias around what financial freedom should look like. And mine is very extreme, a very different end of the spectrum. And that's a lot of what I try and do. I try to lead by example and, and show people how they can craft their own plan and define what financial freedom means for them and go after it in non-traditional ways. Yeah. And so your your year going around Australia to eventually land where you've, where you've landed, you were working through that time? Like you're still operating the business? Can you talk me through what that looked like? Yeah, so the interesting thing, as I'm sure you've done and most advisors do in, in our advice process, we take our clients through some sort of goal-setting exercise. Mm. For years, there was always often a, a goal that would come up, a landmark trip for a, a young family. And they say, okay, I want to get a van and I want to go around Australia for a year with the family. And then when I'd ask them when, it would always be 5, 10, 15 years in the future. I and mean, there would be a, a whole list of reasons why they couldn't do it. And I said, oh, bullshit, like, I'm going to show you how this is done. I'm going to spend a year preparing my business to allow me to then spend a year traveling around Australia working on the business. And the plan was for the entirety of that time to focus on going on podcasts, doing speaking engagements, and basically documenting the journey. It was kind of nerve wracking. There was plenty of like, nights where my head had hit the pillow and I'd be like, Jackson, what are you doing? You're going to like destroy everything. Um, but it all came to fruition. It was far easier than I thought. And uh, it afforded me the opportunity to spend a year doing what many people wait their entire lifetime to do and, and wait until retirement to do. And probably the most gratifying thing is all of that is that I still today have people reach out to me saying, Jackson, I've watched your trip and it inspired me to set my business up and set my finances up. And I've gone and just done a big lap with my family for a year and it was phenomenal and the business continued to grow. And that just feeds my soul as well. So uh, it was, uh, I'm, I'm all about kind of pushing the status quo, so to speak. So what did you do? How did, like, what did you do to set the business up? So are you, like, are, are you today? a financial advisor in the sense that someone comes in and you're helping them with super and insurance and all of these kind of stock standard things that most financial advisors would do? Or are you you're sitting outside of that world now? Like, ha, ha, you know, What did you do to the business to, to do that and, and where are you sitting now? Yeah, so there's basically four key components to any great business. There's marketing, there's sales, there's delivery, and there's growth. And for most of us who are expert technicians, we spend the vast majority of our time in that delivery phase, giving advice, working with clients. And leading up to the, the 12 months traveling in Australia, I basically handed over all of that responsibility to my team. We had employed advisors who were basically taking care of that. Uh, we had a full-time practice manager. Essentially, I'd put all of the, the operations and the delivery component under management mm -hmm. and focusing pretty much exclusively on the marketing and the sales, which the reality was my truth was the marketing and, and sales function, just showing people that we are full of it and we actually practice what we bridge and we created this lifestyle for ourselves was basically the, the best marketing and sales strategy that we could have ever had in our business. Yeah. And my view is also during COVID. And during that year, I actually resigned my AR. Uh, I realized I had to go all in on this and I had to commit to it wholly. Um, in hindsight, I probably uh, uh, I, sh I probably should have kept on to it. I ended up getting restated, not because the business needed it, but more so because I missed it. And I still have a, a small portfolio of clients that I see and, and that I work with. Because I think it's important to keep your tools sharp, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it allows me to be a better group CEO and be able to grow and scale the business when I understand what's happening on the front lines. And sure, there's plenty of successful CEOs who relinquish that completely, uh, but I feel like I need to have some level of attachment to that. But I did resign my AR for 12 months, yep. and, and then I went through the process of getting reappointed uh, a year after I, uh, I got back. <sighs> and so what do your clients look like? Who, who are you? Who is the, the business working with? Yes. So our clients are typically six and seven figure service businesses. So we kind of categorize them as professional services. Uh, we do work with a lot of finance professionals and because we find a lot of them are plumbers with leaky taps. They're so busy helping everyone else that they need somebody in their corner that understands their business. We work with trades. So we've got a lot of electricians, plumbers, builders, and um, we've got allied health and fitness and, and a lot of online businesses, your kind of coaches and e-commerce and that kind of thing. And 
what we kind of realize is that our clients know how to make money, but they don't know how to keep it. And they get themselves to a certain level of scale, which is typically that kind of mid six figures to that early seven figures mark where they've got a great business and they've got good infrastructure in play, but they just don't know where their money's going. And they need to get that structure in place. So our whole philosophy is around helping them remove cash flow bottlenecks in their business and help them create an an investment operating system to take that business profit and turn it into really simple uh, uh, personal wealth and then create a financial freedom roadmap that gets them to financial freedom outside of their business without them having to sell it, ideally in 10 years or less. Um, And that's uh, that's been our our whole philosophy. (laughs) I'm interested in the in the the bit in the business because I, I would imagine there's very few financial advisors, financial advice businesses that are doing that. And certainly, when I'm talking to clients, I'm, I'm often saying, "You'll go and do your thing, whatever your business is. You'll operate. You're going to work with your accountant. At the end of the day, some money is going to come out of the machine, and then I'm going to help you with making the smart decisions about doing something with that money." along the lines of, yeah, retiring and building wealth and all of those kind of things. But I'm not touching the business operations part. How are you getting involved? Like, what are you doing with them in that business operations part? Can you spend a bit of time talking about that? Yeah. So this is really where this came from, is that I had so many self-employed clients because we were just helping them with the wealth piece. We basically would draw a line on a page and say, hey, your accountant deals with the above the line stuff, and we deal with the below the line stuff. Mm. And we're constantly finding ourselves hitting our head up against a brick wall because, as we know, the business is the best wealth creation vehicle that you have, right? You've got active control over it. Um, you can influence the outcome. And there's, there's lots of opportunity there in terms of growth trajectory for many of our clients. They grow 30% plus year on year. And like we, we can't get that out of any, any other investment. True. But then that was coupled with the fact that a lot of these clients were coming to me and saying, Jackson, I want to buy my home or I want to buy this investment property. And we'd go through the motions. And because all of their finance professionals weren't on the same page, they would always fall short and they just weren't paying themselves enough to hit servicing. And we just didn't feel like we had enough control over all of the contributing factors to their ability to create real wealth. So what I basically did is I created a reverse engineering philosophy. The idea behind it is that I don't believe in our clients shrinking themselves wealthy or having a scarcity-based mentality of deferring gratification. I want them to have their cake and eat it too. And it's my own personal belief that most people don't fall short of their goals because of an absence of cash. It's an absence of planning. They just didn't know how much income they needed to earn to live a great lifestyle and also build wealth in the future. Mm. So what we basically do with our clients is we firstly start with a 20-year financial roadmap. Uh, We take them through an exercise that I developed that we define all of their lifestyle and financial goals over 1, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And like less people, they haven't even thought like a year, five years out in the future. And we go through this process on a regular basis and we typically refresh it every 90 days. And it, it continues to get more clarity gets more detailed, things shift and move. But with that exercise, we reverse engineer that into a single income target. So I can say, James, in order for you to achieve all of these goals and aspirations and live your lifestyle now, this is exactly how much you need to earn. Mm. And either we then go and look at the business, we say, okay, your business financial model is supportive of that, beautiful, or more often than not, there's some sort of shortfall. So then we need to discuss, well, what does the financial model need to look like in the business? Or in other words, what levers do we need to pull to start bridging that gap? So let's say for argument's sake, the, the number income targets 400 grand, okay? And let's say the business is a million dollar business doing 20% profit. So it's doing 200 grand, okay? Well, okay, we can grow top line revenue from 1 million to 2 million. It's pretty hard, right? Particularly to try to do that in a short time frame. Well, could we pull the profit lever? Is there a way that we can increase price, that we can change the packaging, that we can change the whole uh, value proposition that we've got in order to increase that profit. So from say 20 to 30%, well, we're already halfway there. Mm. Um, what other cost efficiencies can we get in the business in terms of our direct costs of reviewing our operating expenses? For many businesses, it's not an issue with the financial model, it's financial control. And they just don't have a good cash flow operating system to hold on to the money that they're making. Mm. And they look, look at their financial statements and it says one number and their bank account says another. So we try to implement all of these layers of structure, reverse engineering, understanding the sensitive sensitivity of levers to basically get them into their financial driver's seat, where they say, hey, I want this outcome. This is the exact levers that I need to pull and the activity required to get there. Even to the point that we, for all of our clients, we say, you need this many leads, this many clients at this price point for you to achieve all of your goals, dreams, and aspirations. Mm. And when those two things are linked, it changes their intrinsic drive and motivation to then pursue that plan. Yeah. Um, it's pretty straightforward, but it's super powerful. 
So are you then are you then helping them with the accounting work from for their business too? Like I would I would imagine yeah. to get to that level of clarity and detail, you're probably going to have to. Yeah. Or, or you or are you just kind of tapping in with their existing accountant that's down the road? Like how are you doing that? Yeah, so we've got four core parts. We call profit coaching, which is essentially at the core of everything. It's the financial education. It's one of the biggest issues, James, and I'm sure you've seen this. For many business owners who don't see themselves as financially minded, they abdicate responsibility. Like they want professionals to make decisions for them. And I believe that no one's ever going to love your money like you do. And any good professional relationship should at least be 50-50. And you get out what you put in. So we teach the clients first. Second to that, we've got our wealth advisory, which is all of your typical wealth advisory stuff. Um, we, we are pretty vanilla. We believe that there's three ways to build wealth in this world. There's creating a saleable business and acquiring other businesses, buying good quality blue chip property that we hold for the long term, and investing in the stock market, typically through managed funds and, and index funds. We don't stock pick. We believe in long-term accumulation. The idea is we want wealth to be passive, but there's a big strategic element for business owners, particularly in regards to acquisitions and exits and tax considerations. Hmm. Then we've got uh, our tax advisory business, and we help business owners with, uh, with their structuring of both their business and their wealth, um, and obviously doing things like their bookkeeping and financial reporting and that kind of thing. And then the last thing is lending. And um, we, we've built a lending business and a panel of, of lenders who basically allow us to provide proactive lending advice to our clients, because there's always going to be a lending element to our wealth strategy, whether that be growing the business uh, or whether that be growing their property portfolio. And um, so those are basically the four parts. And we develop them in such a way where if clients have any of those components elsewhere and they are adding value, we're not there to tread on their toes. We basically show them how we do things and then we try and play nicely together to get the client the best possible outcome. And that works really well. Um, it just it, it requires the other professionals to kind of learn our way, which can sometimes be a little bit shocking because it's not that common. Um, but so far, it's 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 been it's been very successful. Yeah, and so hence then the like you mentioned through there that that kind of one three five ten that kind of time frame that that you're talking about you mentioned in there that you you may be refreshing that every 90 days and i'm sitting here thinking if that's just my standard financial planning client and they've got their business operating here i'm not meeting with them every 90 days but but you're there's a lot more work that you guys are doing with them hence uh, meeting with them 90 every 90 days is well and truly worthwhile Exactly. And look, we, we have a really high touch uh, value proposition. Uh, we've done a lot of work to try and commoditize a lot of the educational piece. So we have probably thousands of hours now of educational training in our portal, group calls, things that we run. Uh, we run leverage coaching every week and because we realize that 70% of the conversations that I had with a client are educational. It's mm-hmm. just about them having the, 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 fun, the foundational understanding for us to then have a strategic discussion. And I realized that if I could commoditize that to either turn it into a, a DIY playbook that a client can do in their own time when it suits them, or into a group setting or a summit um, where they can learn with the benefit of others' experiences and insights, then it means that when they do catch up with an advisor one-on-one, it's specifically around the, the things that are going to move the needle for them. Yeah. Because there's always that preconceived understanding. Um, and that allows us to be very efficient and to, to serve more clients than what a, a traditional advice practice. Would. Yeah, I was going to say, because yeah, because if, you, if you're taking that out, so you're doing it, it's something that's been running through my head to do with clients as well. You're doing a weekly, or you or someone in, in the business is doing a weekly group call of sorts, educating on something. Is that just like a random, not a random topic, but a, a, a planned sequence of topics each week that and then people can just tune in is if they want to? Yeah, we call it the help desk. So yep. we currently run two help desks a week and with, two, with different experts. And what we will normally do is we'll mix up the professionals on our team. So sometimes we'll have an accountant and a financial advisor. Sometimes it'll be a mortgage broker and a profit coach or a mixture of the of the lot. Yep. The, usually what we'll do is we'll have in that hour session, there'll be about 10 or 15 minutes of, of new content. And it'll be teaching on something that's happened or a particular framework or a question that's come up that is an important teaching. And then we'll open it up for Q&A, uh, either to talk on that topic or a bit of a round robin if people want help on a particular topic. And then essentially, of course, given that it's a group setting, it's educational or general advice. And then we then steer that person back to their advisor if there's any specifics that they need. Mm-hmm. Um, but at least we've covered all of the, the kind of educational or high level stuff in a group setting. Um, and basically, they're getting essentially and um, potentially up to 100 or more touch points than they would with, a, uh, I guess, a traditional advisor. Um, and, of course, they, they pay for that privilege. We're, we're definitely not, not cheap, 
um, and our clients pay a premium because they want that that level of involvement with us. Yeah, gotcha. And is that then so the, the, like the, the Q and A type uh, part to that to those sessions? Are, are people asking questions beforehand, or is it just all on the fly in in the meeting? It's really interesting, mate, that I've played with so many different models and obviously I've looked out to other experts in other industries and the, the thing that I've constantly butted my head up against is that money still has so many taboos. Yeah. And particularly in Australia with this whole kind of whole tall poppy thing, trying to condition people to feel comfortable enough to share anything vulnerable, particularly about their finances in a group setting, is an uphill battle, right? Mm. And I've seen many other types of, of coaches try and facilitate a similar thing with great results just because it's not financially oriented. They do this with marketing or sales or social media or whatever, and people froth on it. But money has this weird stigma. So what we've found is that we facilitate a bit of dialogue and we create an open forum. And and then we kind of create it in a way where people can kind of create an environment that they're not necessarily uh, giving all of the intimate details of their situation, but they might propose a scenario and we've kind of got to deduce what they're getting at and read between the lines to give enough context without outing them. Yeah. So that's probably the biggest uh, the biggest quirk associated with doing this. Yeah. The advice that I can give to anybody looking to do it is one, it's phenomenal because it just allows you so much more face time, particularly as, as a director in the business. I obviously don't have time to see everyone one-on-one and that's a big issue to scale in advice, right? Particularly in the current regulatory environment. So Having a group style format allows you to have that face time as you hand off the implementation relationships to maybe other team members. Um, but in, for you to be successful, it needs to be, you need to have some level of, of education and people want to be entertained. So if it feels like they're getting teeth pulled, they're probably not going to show up. Yeah. So bring some entertainment value. Two, make it a safe space. So I just say, hey, this is a judgment-free zone. We're all here for the same reasons. I guarantee there's other people on this call, whoever's going to watch the recording, and they've experienced the same thing or they're wanting to ask the same question, but they just didn't have the guts to ask today. Yeah. Um, and make sure that you put a positive spin on any, anything, right? Um, most people, particularly when they're getting started with their financial management, they only ask for help when there's issues. So you want them to obviously try and come sooner. Um, so you don't want to just kind of, make them jaded by asking for help. So you can't, cause sometimes got to be really creative in your responses. So they feel like um, it's been a, a great experience, even when they're, we're solving problems together, if that yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, so that's a, a soft skills that you just got to learn through a petition. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Interesting one to be part of. Uh, yeah, as I said, I've, I've thought of doing the same kind of thing as you start to, and you, as you start to hand over clients, you can't work with everyone all, all the time. So are you then doing, Are you meeting with clients as part of a, like the kind of sales introduction part of the business? Are you meeting with them at all, or you're you're the face of the the social media and wherever else you know your your marketing activities, and then everyone else just takes care of it from there, and you just poke your head in when you need to. Yeah. So coming back to those four quadrants, I remove myself from the delivery piece first, and then the operations. So we've got a full time COO in the business, um, who manages all of the businesses. Yeah. The next part that I was involved in was sales and marketing. And the next thing that I, I built was a sales team. And uh, we have a team of BDMs that essentially understand all of our, our, our businesses and all of the products that we, that we have available. Yeah. And they essentially take a client through an onboarding process where they understand their needs. We've got a diagnostic scorecard that identifies where they need help. Um, and then we essentially uh, suggest the appropriate packages. In many cases, they combine packages between the various businesses. And then they help enroll those clients and then hand them over to the relevant experts. And we found that was really important in a multidisciplinary business because other businesses that I'd seen try and do the same where the experts were doing the sales is they always feed themselves first, right? Mm -hmm. If you're the financial advisor, you're going to onboard the client for financial advice first and then potentially hand them off to the accountant or the mortgage broker or whoever. And we found it was kind of a disjointed experience for the client. When the client comes to Aureus, they don't see four separate businesses. They see one business that does different things. So we needed to design an onboarding and indoctrination experience that was conducive of the client's expectations and also had an independent uh, person who didn't have any affinity to any of the individual businesses to just make the right suggestion for that particular client based on what they needed. And that's been immensely successful. And then at the moment, basically, I work with our uh, marketing director um, to essentially do content and be the face of the business. And it's my ultimate objective to diversify that risk as well and to get more faces into the business and uh, and allow me to – I still want to continue to play a role. Um, I have no intention to, to sell the business. 
Um, however, it is still a key person risk when I'm uh, the primary rainmaker. Um, so uh, it's building up those other personalities in the business is the, the next step to crack. Yeah. That, uh, that onboarding type process when you've got the different the different elements, do you is it do you take the approach of you kind of onboard them a little bit in each of the different areas over time, or is it that the BDM or whoever it is that that's that kind of working with them that that kind of more independent person, are they happy to identify where the greatest need is first and say, okay, well you need more help over here at the moment, let's get that sorted and then we'll deal with this thing and this thing and this thing later on. Is that the what's the type of process followed there? Yeah, you're bang on, mate. Um, mm. There are obviously certain clients who need help with all kind of four elements of the business, um, but we, we find that obviously we need to set the expectation to say, hey, look, you're basically going to be onboarding for four businesses at once. There's four lots of things that we need. And sure, we're going to work together to kind of lighten that load. And there's information that's going to be required for all, but there is obviously an increased level of work and bandwidth, particularly for the kind of first six to eight weeks for that client. So what we do try and do where we can avoid it is we try and then roll that out incrementally over time based on what the client needs. And and our BDMs are responsible for touching base with the client at 30 days, 90 days, six months, 12 months, and, and just basically touching base, seeking feedback, getting client case studies, and then identifying any other ways that we can help. And yep. so the system works really well and, and the clients seem to enjoy it. Can you, can you talk a little bit about what your fee structure looks like? You know, you share as much as you're comfortable sharing, but, yes, sure. but there's different elements... I imagine from what you're saying here, there's there's an accounting type fee, there's a financial advice type fee, there's the mortgage broking. Can can you talk a little bit about what the fee structures look like for clients? Yep. So let's start with the mortgage broking. It's pretty straightforward. We still mm. run that business on a, a commission based model, um, and basically we, we we did try and take that to a fee for service. We just don't feel the industry and the space is ready yet, yeah. and for for that kind of service, and um, so that that's purely on a commission basis. Accounting packages start at about a thousand bucks a month, and we only take accounting clients who also do bookkeeping. Now, mm-hmm. we've designed a philosophy that's called single touch accounting, whereby we want to make sure that we do weekly reconciliation, monthly management reporting, um, quarterly tax planning, and then obviously leading into the annual compliance and forecasting. Um, so, you, so, are you doing the bookkeeping? Do You're doing the bookkeeping for them, or that's, that's so you do the bookkeeping for yeah, them? Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, we just found that the quality of the bookkeeping was so bad uh, externally, just to, across the board, that we felt we needed to control that because it just creates so much extra rework and, and obviously ki- kills efficiency in the business. Yeah. And um, the profit coaching side of things starts at a thousand dollars a month as well, mm-hmm. and and that's largely going to be dependent on the size of the business. And that wealth usually starts off at about five grand upfront and a thousand bucks a month for you one, and then we typically ta- take the clients down. And yeah. our whole philosophy in terms of advice is that. Our clients, we want to get them to a point where they actually don't need us anymore, at least in the same capacity. Hmm. And because a lot of it is coaching and is that initial strategic advice, and then we usually taper our clients down over time. So there's typically more revenue up front because there's more work. And yes. But usually those clients will, that gets the average annual value for those clients is probably in the vicinity of eight to 12 grand ongoing as a worth client, um, depending on the caliber and, and what kind of support that they need. Yep. And then there's their business services related. Uh, things that you're doing separately, anyway. And, and is that are they all are, are they all like in like kind of independent engagements with them? Like in, in financial advice land, there's fee disclosure statements and all those kind of things, and you're locked in. Yeah, I'm just trying to, as I'm asking you the question, trying to think how you'd run that. So you've got it, it's all just independent engagements, wouldn't it be for the yeah, services that you're be. providing? Yeah. When we did try to develop this wholesale strategy, I tried to find a way where we could have that as one payment for the clients. But of course, we just wanted to make sure that all of the services were independent and delineated in terms of what they were paying and what was the service. And of course, in terms of us being able to reconcile FDS and things like that in the future, it just made sense to have that all segmented. So the clients have a kind of a seamless um, a kind of sales process. We could then segment billing and take them through separate processes in terms of the onboarding and indoctrination. And then, of course, we've got a disclosure agreement between the various businesses to allow us to transfer information so the clients have yeah. to answer the same questions multiple yeah. times. I love it. Like that, that's a, it's a really, uh, like I know, it's a really exciting, as I said at the start, I was excited to talk to you. It's an exciting uh, business to kind of start to learn about and, and, and hear what you've done because uh, there's lots of people doing their one-off, you know, their individual financial advisor or they sell their business into a bigger financial advice business. And as you said, they're uh, – they're still the kind of the, the practitioner. They're the salesperson of the practitioner. They're doing all of that 
whereas you've managed to, a lot of people try to do what you've done, but you've managed to lift yourself out of that space and and, and successfully build the business all around you, which is fantastic. I can't say it's been easy um, <laughs> and there's always been challenges. However, I think that the big part that it comes down to is having having a proactive plan out of what you're trying to get to. Like my vision is that I want to build a $100 million business and ideally I want to get Aureus in a position where we could potentially list on the stock market in the next five years. Um, my whole value proposition is that I want us to be Australia's number one unprofessional services business. And I don't, I don't know if anybody's just watching the audio version, but I don't... I, I'm, I roll around in King G stubbies, Crocs, um, and uh, my kind of unkept beard uh, the majority of the time. And this is good. I feel comfortable like this. However, our clients resonate with great service. We have to be happy with it. Um, so that's my vision. And to chase that takes courage. And I think this is a big part that gets in the way for so many business owners. Like I've had the pleasure of mentoring a lot of finance professionals over the years. Yeah. And it takes guts to back yourself, right? Yeah. To come up with, well, who do you want to be? What's the business that you want to build? And how do you go through the, the various stepping stones to get from where you are to where you want to go? And I know the hardest transition, particularly for myself, is how do you get out of that technician phase? Because that being an expert, it's a J curve, right? And the longer you stay in that seat, the harder it is to get out of it. But hopefully, uh, and I share my journey very openly. I've written about it in my books. Um, even everything we teach our clients is all available free online. Um, I give it all away freely. Um, and it's just because I, I believe in rising tides lifting all ships. And I want this industry and people to participate in it to go and build amazing businesses and give advice to help change lives. And we only do that by being uh, really open and free with with our IP. And uh, I, I, I try my best to do that so that people can have courage and the motivation they need to, to go and conquer the world. And there's a lot that people can learn from from your kind of marketing activities of, uh, and I've seen you talk about it in in some of your videos and things about you know wearing the suit and tie and stuff like that's not not you. You talk you know you just mentioned about uh, the beard and the clothes that you wear and all the rest of it. Like like I've seen it plenty of times. You get a lot of people online saying to you, "You don't look like you know anything. You look like you're homeless." Like you, you cop all of that type of stuff, and. That's what that's what holds a lot of people back from putting themselves out there online, and 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 at, at least how that how that uh, affects you offline, I have no idea. But how you deal with it online uh, is is fantastic. Like some of these people that say you know some some horrible things online, at least from that online presence, you don't let it phase you. But you then use that as an opportunity to say, well. I've done this. 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 It's like you got this big whack back to them, to, and uh, but that you know that the worry of someone criticizing the way they look, the way they sound, the way they walk, whatever it might be, uh, holds a lot of people back from the whole marketing exercise that that you're doing. But a lot of credit to you that you, know, you push through that rubbish that people put online and and use it as <laughs> as, as part of the marketing anyway. Yeah, to be honest, mate, I love it. I think it's fantastic. It, it, it makes me laugh so much. And look, I'm very, I'm a very confident person. I'm very sure in myself. Um, and I realise that that to achieve anything in this world comes at a cost, right? There is nothing in this world that is free. Okay. And if you want to build a great business, if you want to achieve amazing scale, if you want to have real impact, then you need to build a brand. And whether that's a, a traditional brand or an online brand, and, and online, particularly social media, and James, you've seen this in terms of your success on social media, it just catches fire. And it's not that you have to do anything special. You just need to be perseverant. And if you're going to allow internet trolls to get under your skin and, and allow their remarks to impact you, then you're not going to be able to stick the journey. And frankly, it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with them. Yeah, yeah. For somebody to go out of their way to make those ty- types of, of snide remarks about me and my appearance has nothing to do with my appearance and everything to do with what's going on in their life. So I frankly feel sorry for them. But the interesting thing is that in life, you're always going to have haters and you're going to have people who love you. And I know that for every hater that's out there that throws shade at me, there is 10 people that send me a DM they go, Jackson, like, I don't know why you cop all of this flack. You're awesome. Um, like, I, you, I watched this video and I've achieved X, Y, Z. And it's just so fulfilling. And look, I don't know if everybody gets that. Um, but I think you need to understand and disconnect the difference between doing the activity. I have made a lifelong commitment to doing the work. 
and I'm unwavering in that commitment. And the outcome, I know the outcome will come and many outcomes have come for me. And I know that for the amount of activity that I'm doing, there must be greater outcomes in the future. I just don't know how long that's going to take. But because I disconnected those two things for myself and I just focus on doing the work that I don't care about the outcome and I don't measure myself by the bad comments. Right. Um, so I think that's the mindset that you need to approach it by. And once again, it comes back to that courage. Um, do you have the courage to show up and be seen the way that you want to be seen in the world? Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, that's a great message to be sharing with your clients as well, as I'm sure, as I'm sure you probably do. This kind of disconnecting the work from the outcome, the outcome will come if you do the work and you built the machine to actually help them identify the work that they need to do to generate the outcome that they that they want. That's fantastic. Look, Jackson, thank you for for joining me this afternoon for recording this. It's a it's a Tuesday afternoon as we're as we're recording. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to have a chat with you and get an understanding of of the machine. Um, congratulations to what you've built. I'm uh, I'm excited to follow along your journey to see where it takes you over the next twelve months and five years and ten years and and beyond. Thanks for uh, spending some time with me. My absolute pleasure, mate.